This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. There has been a lot of fascination and interest of late in the royal family and the life of Queen Elizabeth upon her passing on September 8th. And estimates are given that 4.1 billion people watched her funeral, the most watched televised event in the history of the world. Now that phenomenon itself is worthy of study. What is so enamoring about a funeral? But apparently there's something so captivating about the pageantry and pomp that really captures people's attention and imagination. Look, the Queen had successfully put forth for decades a polished demeanor of royalty, of understanding, and it is said that the Queen had a pretty uh, wicked sense of humor. Story goes, the Queen would enjoy hiking in her castle at Balmoral in Scotland, and she would always go with her protection officer. And once while uh, hiking, they bumped into American tourists who did not recognize her, and they struck up a conversation. They said, oh, you're from England? Did you ever meet the Queen? And uh, without batting an eyelash, she looked them straight in the eye and says, nope, but he has. He even spends time with her. He said, Really? Could we take a picture with him? So they took a picture together with the correction officer and the queen happily served as photographer. She was a fixture as a monarch for 70 years, was sovereign over 32 states. During her reign, she ruled over more than 130 prime ministers. I remember when I spoke in Sydney, Australia, in the middle of the laning, they made a Misha Beirach for Queen Elizabeth because... Australia is a constitutional monarchy, and the Queen is sovereign. And there's also been a lot of fascination with the new King, King Charles III. It's quite amazing, King Charles actually had a bris milah. He was circumcised, and he was circumcised by a rabbi, an amoyal, Rabbi Jacob Snowman, who was a physician and one of the leading moyalim in London. Apparently this is a tradition that dates back to the early 1700s, when King George I, who was born in Germany, imported the custom of German noblemen to Davka have Mohalim circumcise their son. But here's what I'm interested in. I'm interested in Philip, King Charles' father. How was he Zoycha to father the king? Why was he Zoycha to marry Queen Elizabeth? He's not of royal English lineage, even though his mother was a great-granddaughter of Queen Victoria, but he was not in line for the throne. He did not have strong connection to British monarchy. It's interesting. So uh, Philip's mother, Alice, marries the Prince of Greece, Prince Andrew of Greece, and uh, she moves to Greece. Philip's mother moves to Greece, and she's very unhappy with her husband. She was a religious Christian, He drifted into disillusion, he left her, he became completely devoted to a life of drinking, Uh, he was an alcoholic, a life of gambling, and somehow Prince Andrew of Athens and Alice have a kid, Philip, who has no connection to British monarchy, and he ends up marrying the Queen of England and becomes the the father of the current King of England, King Charles? What's the reason for that? So while 4.1 billion people are taken by the pomp and ceremony of Queen Elizabeth's Levaya, to me the question of the day is, how did Philip, who is a, a, an outsider, he's a Tzige Kimener, you know, the Schwer, Phil, uh, uh, Elizabeth's father was very suspicious of allowing him into the family, of allowing Philip into the family. He said, you can't bring him in, he's, he's a newcomer, where does he come in? But somehow... He's a funny guy, and Elizabeth uh, liked him, and they get married, and he's married to the Queen of England for 70 years. He becomes the father of the king and the patriarch of all future kings of England. How is that, a, how is that for a subject for this year's Shabbos Shuvadrasha Tavshin Pegimel? And I believe the answer to this question will highlight an insight that will heighten and deepen a truth that could use a lot more focus. I'm sure many of you have had this chus 
to visit Reb Chaim Knievsky Zechat Tzadik Levracha. I have. It's a memory of a lifetime just to have a few moments with the God of Hadar to get a bracha, to ask a question. Did you ever go to his house and not get in? I did. I arrived. It wasn't ours. And I had to wait. Now, while I was there, there were people who were allowed in. Now, imagine for a moment if Rebel Yashiv Zechaz HaKlevracha came. Sure, they would have let him in. Imagine if Rebbe Gershon Edelstein would have come. Imagine Rebbe Aaron Leib, Rebbe Yitzhak Zilberstein. They would have all been allowed in. Imagine if after Rebbe Aaron Leib got in, I would have knocked on the door. Who's there? Gladstein. Yeah, what do you want? I would have said, just like you let in Rebbe Aaron Leib, let me in also. Oh, chutzpah. You know, time of, you know what type of audacity that is? How, how presumptuous that is? How do you put yourself in the same league with those giants? How dear you have the chutzpah to make such a request? And yet, do you realize that we make a request every day in the slichais that's even more audacious? We say, Misha Anna la Avraham Avinu Bahar Hamoiria Huyanenu. Misha Anna li Yitzchak Kishanek Ragabayam is Beach Huyanenu. Misha Anna le Liahu Bahar Akarmu Yanenu. Do you realize how brazen that is? What in the world does Hashem have? What in the world does the fact that Hashem answered Avraham Avinu have to do with answering us? Amr Avinu had such great love for HaKadosh Baruch Hu that he loved Hashem even more than he loved his only son that was born to him in his old age. That was his whole continuity and legacy. He's someone who the Navi Yeshaya calls Avraham Oyhavi. So of course Hashem answered Avraham, but why would that mean that Hashem should answer us as well? How dare you even say that? How dare you say in the same breath, Hashem, you answered Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov Avinu is the Bechir Shaba Avos. His image is engraved on the Kisei HaKavayid. And yet we say it with a straight face. This is much more audacious than if we were to say, you let Rebel Yashiv in, you answered Rebel Yashiv, so let me in as well. How could we say it? It's a joke. It's ridiculous. But it's not. And we say it. And we say it because it's true. And to recognize and appreciate just how true it is, how important we are, we always have to go back to the beginning. We go back to Adam Marishan and Gan Eden. Adam Marishan was put in the Garden of Eden, and he's given just one mitzvah. Don't eat the fruit. You want to eat bananas? Eat bananas. You want to eat avocado? Eat your heart out of avocado. But don't eat the fruit! And Adam couldn't help it. He listened to his wife, he ate the fruit, he brought Misa to the world. Anyone who ever died, it's because of the sin of Adam Harishain. All troubles, all tsaros, the need to, to make a living, to earn a livelihood, it's all because of Adam Harishain. Herzechayim, the Torah's Koyanim. Rabbi Yoisi Oimer, Im Nav Shechal Adas, Matan Scharon, Shal Tzadikim, Lasid Lavai. If you want to know the reward of the righteous in the future, go learn out from the original man. He was only commanded on one mitzvah. In one love. He violated it. See how many deaths were pe- he was penalized with. Now let's extrapolate. Says the Medrash Vachi Eza Mida Meruba. What attribute is greater? Midas Hatoiva or Midas Paranias? God's attribute of reward or punishment? Have a Oimer Midas Hatoiva reward. Says the Medrash. Well, if reward is greater than punishment, Hashav Min Hapigulin, one who refrains from eating pigle, Vahanoisar. All the more so. Says the Medrash, if the ramifications of Adam Arisha and sin were such, imagine the reward if somebody refrains from eating on Yom Kippur. 
Now I understand, God's attribute of reward is greater than punishment. But how can you possibly learn anything out from Adam Harishain? That if the repercussions of his actions were so grand, then the repercussions of our actions are also equal or even more monumental. Are you kidding me? To learn out from Adam Arishan, Chazal tell us Adam Arishan stood Mehaaretz on the Rakia. When the angels saw him, they trembled. They were awestruck. Chazal said the ball of his ankle illuminated. That it made the sun pale in comparison. Tau boy Malache Asharis Ubikshuloi Marshira. The angels thought he was a deity. So you're going to compare us to Adam Arishain? Adam was Yitzir Kap of Shal Kalash Baruch Hu. So of course his actions had ramifications. They made a difference in this world. But how do I, how do Ani HaKatan, what is my worth compared to Adam HaRishain? But clearly Chazal are telling us that irrespective of who you are, when you live, what your circumstances are, your actions are important. Your choices matter. Your role in the world is crucial, it's fundamental. The choices you make, the decisions you make, have an effect in this world. Here is the greatest impediment to tshuva. Actually, this is the greatest impediment to any meaningful growth in Avayda Sashem. Not recognizing one's own worth, one's own value in the eyes of Hashem. So what? I came late to davening. So what? I didn't learn. So what? I looked. Hashem cares whether I cover my hair, I don't cover my hair. Money! Who am I? What is my value? What is my worth? And with that attitude, the ideal of shmiras ha of dikduk bahalacha, of dikduk bahmitzvahs is throw, thrown under the rug with the American attitude that could be summed up in one word. It's a word that takes everything that is sacred, everything that is important, and it renders everything meaningless. And it's a word you should never let your children say. And there are many words you should never let them say. But here's one. That word is whatever. In other words, what I think, what I say, what I do is not important. And you know why it's not important? Because I'm not important. Who am I anyway? Hashem has more important things to worry about than if I'm medakdek b'mitzvahs. And if a person doesn't recognize that their actions make a difference in this world, why would they mo- be motivated to make meaningful change? But we are important. Because contrary to what the Yitzhahar would like us to think, we are so valued and cherished and important to Hashem that we are no less important than Avraham Avinu, than Yaakov Avinu, than Moshe Rabbeinu, than Hananiah, Mishal, Azaria. Because they had a neshama, which is a chelak alekamimal, and we have a neshama that's a chelak alekamimal. And they were Hashem's children, and we are Hashem's children. And Hashem values us, loves us, and is interested in us. And if we do something wrong, Hashem is just as disappointed in us as if Moshe Rabbeinu would have done in Avera, Chas V'Shalem, or even Adam Arishain. We are no less important in the world or in the eyes of Hashem. And we are not the least bit ashamed or embarrassed to stay with a straight face. God, you answered Eliyahu, you answered Daniel, you answered Hanan and Mishal Vazariah. Please answer us. We are no less dear, no less beloved, no less important to Hashem than any tzaddik who ever lived. What do you think is the most important concept in Yahados? What do you think is the Yisoid that all service of Hashem rests on? Rabbi Yoyna, the author of Shari Tshuva, we're now learning Yisoid at Tshuva. Rabbi Yoyna wrote Igeras at Tshuva, wrote a the Rif and Brachais. He also wrote a work entitled Share Ho'avoida. And I would like to give out to you an excerpt from the opening of the Share Ho'avoida, Rabbi Yoyna. This is reproduced from a book, Majesty of Man, with permission from Art Scroll. Rabbi Yoyna begins his Sefer with a very powerful opening. 
says Rabbi Yoyna, Ha Pesach Harishon Hu Sheyeda Ha'ish Ha'oyved Erech Atzmai. The first step in Avodas Hashem is recognizing your own value. V'yakir ma'alosoi, realizing your stature. Umalas avoisov in the stature of your ancestors. V'yasa shalo yevoishu avoisov midrachav umimasov kifi koychoi v'asagas yadai. Act in a way that your ancestors would not be embarrassed of you. Says Rabbi Yoyna, realizing your worth has a major Benefit, it will emerge from here. When you have a desire, when it will arise in your mind to do something that's improper, you'll be embarrassed from yourself, you'll be embarrassed from your forefathers, you'll say about yourself, Adam Someone so important. Sheyeshbi kama malois toy voice ramois when he says it has so many great qualities. Vishani ben gadoilim and that I'm the descendant of great people. Eich ese hara hagadoila hazois. How can I lower myself? You know what the greatest pitfall in the service of Hashem? Humility, false humility. Why does it matter when I come, what I look at, how I say the words, how much time I learn, how I speak to my spouse? It doesn't matter. I'm like an ant in this world. Hashem is really so concerned. But if you look in the Gemara and get in Daphnon Ches, the Gemara tells us the story of the son and the daughter, Rabbi Shmuel Kayin Gadal, who are taken captive separately. They were both exquisitely good looking. And their captors got together and put them in the same room, hoping that this union would produce the most exquisitely looking children that would command a tremendous price on the slave market. And in the room, the brother and the sister, who didn't know of the identity of each other, were faced with this challenge. What gave them the fortitude and the wherewithal to overcome such a challenge? Fear of God? No. Love of Hashem? No. What gave? Frumkeit? No. Self-worth. He said, Ani koyen. Ben koyhanim gedoylem. I'm great. I have great ancestry. Eches shifcha. How could I marry a maidservant? Vizoy soymeres. Ani koyhenes. Bas koyhanim gedoylem. This one said, I'm a koyhenes. How could I do this? At the end of the day, the greatest insurance policy, it's not Yerushalayim. It's recognizing who you are and your importance. And I believe this is one of the important messages of the Tefillah Misha. Ana la Avraham avinu bahar ha-mariya hu yanenu. That we should feel our importance and our self-worth. And that should give us the motivation to shore up and tighten up everything we do. All of our anhagais, all of our observances. Because misha'ana l'chol ha-tzadikim ha-chasidim. We are no less beloved to Hashem than any tzadik who ever lived. Actually, let's say more than that. Because as beloved as the Torah and mitzvahs of earlier generations were, our Torah and mitzvahs in a certain respect is even more important and even more beloved and even more dear to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. There's once a princess, wise, intelligent, the king would give her whatever she wanted with great pleasure and everyone knew that if you wanted the princess to intercede on your behalf, you better butter her up and give her some kind of extraordinary gift because after all, what could you possibly give the princess? She had everything. But one time someone spread false allegations against the princess. And she was put in jail. And she's waiting to clear her name. It wasn't good conditions for her. She didn't have all her necessities. A man sees her plight, brings her some decent clothing, some food. And this, these packages were more dear to her than any grand gift that she ever received when she was in the palace. Months pass. Her name is cleared. She's sitting on a throne in full grandeur and glory. 
She's wearing royalty on her head. Who does she remember? She remembers the man who provided her with the modest gift at the time of her plight. It says, Rabbi Yosef in the Hakdama to Nanafi Tzavais. When the Beis HaMikdash stood to find favor in the eyes of Hashem, you would have to do, boy, you would have to do a mitzvah to bring honor to Hashem, because after all, what honor is Hashem missing? It was Yakiru V'yedu Koyesh Sevel. But now the Shechina is in Golos, in the darkest Golos in history. A decadent, backward, immoral, hedonistic society. Now even the smallest mitzvah is so beloved and dear in the eyes of Hashem. Every word of Torah, every zuchus, every chesed has value like it never had before. You know, sometimes a person may get down on themselves. Where do I fit in in this world? What's my role? What's my purpose? Do I matter? I want to share with you a story. I heard the story from Rabbi Krohn. He once, uh, by Daniel Rafalowitz's bris, he met me. He said, you want, to, you want to come with me to Italy? I said, sure. And uh, there he told over the story. And he said that people ask him all the time, what's his uh, favorite story? He said, it's very hard to say what his favorite story is, but the following is top three. Story happened 65 years ago in 1957 with the musical genius, the brilliant conductor, Arturo Toscanini. He was a great conductor. He led orchestras all over the world. He was a perfectionist and had a raging temper, but people tolerated him because he was a genius. No one could lead an orchestra like him. Now, there was a biographer who was writing his life story. He died at 89 years old in 1958, and this happened in 1957, a year before his death. And the biographer says to Toscanini, please, can I come over tomorrow night? We want to finish the interview. The producer is waiting. The publisher is waiting for the manuscript. He said, no, no, tomorrow night you can't come. I'm busy tomorrow night. He said, Your Honor, what's tomorrow night? He said, you know that I used to travel all over the world and I can't travel anymore because of my age, because of my frailties. But tomorrow night there's a concert going on in Europe and I used to lead the orchestra and tomorrow night there's going to be someone else leading it. And it's going to be on shortwave radio and I need to hear that concert. I want to hear how that conductor is going to lead the concert. I can't have any interruptions. He says, Your Honor, it would be my honor, it would be my privilege to spend some time with you. I will sit in the room, I'll go to the other side, I won't say a word. Please, please, let me listen together with you. He says, you won't say a word? He says, I promise. Okay, so come. Next night, it's a quarter to eight, biographer comes, he sits himself down on the other side of the room. Eight o'clock, Toscanini turns on the shortwave radio, and they listen together. Concert lasts 45 minutes, it's over, Toscanini turns it off. Biographer turns to Toscanini. He says, that was magnificent. Says, Toscanini says, no, it wasn't. He said, what do you mean? It was beautiful. No, it was terrible. So said, what do you mean? Toscanini says, there were supposed to be 120 musicians there, 15 violinists, only 14 violinists showed up. The guy thinks this Toscanini is out of his mind. It's crazy. How could he possibly know on shortwave radio that only 14 violinists showed up? But he's not going to tell him, otherwise he's not going to finish the interview. So he, he leaves. The next morning, the biographer says, you know, let me, let me call up uh, the musical director in Europe. He calls him up. He says, by the way, I'm an, an American correspondent. You got to tell me last night, please, how many people were supposed to be playing in the orchestra? He says, very interesting, you should be asking that. Because actually 120 were supposed to come. 15 violinists, only 14 showed up. Correspondent was floored. How in the world could Toscanini have known only 14 showed up? He calls him up. He says, Your Honor, I owe you an apology. How did you know that one violinist was missing? So let me explain something to you. There's a big difference between me and you. See, you're part of the audience. 
The audience thinks everything sounds great, everything's wonderful, but I'm the conductor, and the conductor needs to know, needs to hear every note of music that could play, every tone, every sound. When I concentrated on the violin, I realized it didn't resonate the way it usually does, and I knew without a doubt, someone was missing. Sometimes we think, does it matter when I come to shul, how much I learn, if I guard my eyes, how I dress, how I observe? And the answer is, to the guy next to you, to me, maybe it doesn't matter. But to the conductor of the World Symphony, who hears every line of Tyra, who knows every word of tefillah that could be sung, to him it makes a very big difference. Every act we do, every word we say, every thought we have, is valuable to the conductor of the universe. But the truth is, we are much more than just a musician playing a lone instrument. Now it's very interesting. We just spent a few years studying Psuke de Zimra from Ms. Marsher until Yishtabach. We know that if someone has limited time and he can't say the whole Psuke de Zimra, minimum, Baruch Sha'amar Ashrei Yishtabach. You have a few more moments, the next thing you should say, the final Halalukah. After all, the purpose of Psuke de Zimra is to be from the Goimrei Halal B'chol Yoim, so you want to say the final chapter of Tehillim. And if there's more time, Rashi says in Masech the Shabbos, the most important of all the Halalukas, besides the final one, is the third Halalukah. Hallelujah. Hallelu es Hashem and Hashemai. What is more important about this Mizmar more than any other Hallelujah? They're all praising Hashem. Look at the first Hallelujah. How beautiful it is. Bitachain. What, what's so valuable about the third Hallelujah? Says Rabbi Isaac Shari, yes, all the Hallelujah speak about the praise of Hashem, but the third Hallelujah speaks about the praise of man. Man is depicted as the center of the universe. Man is depicted as the conductor of the universe. He turns with his baton and he sees the signals. Hallelujah, Hashem, min Hashemayim, heaven, praise Hashem. Hallelujah, Malachav. Michael, Gabriel, praise Hashem. The angels say, say what? You're talking to me? Who do you think you are? To give me orders. And we say, we are the conductor of this, of this universe. We order you. We say, Hallelujah, Shemesh, V'yoreach, praise Hashem, sun and moon. The mighty sun that sends light down to the earth at 186,000 Miles per second. The sun that releases 384.6 septillion watts of energy per second takes orders from you every morning when we say, Hallelujah, Shemesh V'yoreach. We turn to the earth. Hallelujah, Min Ha'aretz. Eish, Ubarad, Sheleg, Vikitar. Ruach Sa'ara, we say, Hallelujah. Hurricane Ion, praise Hashem. Heharim v'chol Gavais. Mount Everest, at 29,030 feet tall, five and a half miles tall. It waits our order in the morning to praise Hashem. Malchei Eretz kings, princes, officers, presidents. We turn to Joe. We say, Joe! Joe! Mr. President, praise Hashem. We turn to Kim Jong-un. We say, Kim, get your finger off the button for a second. Praise Hashem. It is the Jew who stands at the epicenter of the world, and not only as a musician, as the conductor of the world, signals to all mankind, signals to all of creation, to praise Hashem. So we are not only a musician in an orchestra, but Hashem has empowered each one of us to be the conductor of the world, where all creation awaits our signal and our direction. 
and recognizing that we are the conductors of the universe and we are the epicenter of creation. We recognize that what we do in this world, it makes a difference. Sometimes it will make a difference in our life. Sometimes it will make a difference in the life of our children. And sometimes the decisions we make will reverberate many generations later. Rav Pam would relate, 1976, he was in the city of Bethlehem, New Hampshire, and he was feeling, uh, he, was, he took ill, came down with a very high fever, he was feeling very faint, and he says to his wife, help, I think I'm going to faint, I'm going to faint, and his wife screams, what should I do? And she runs out to the neighbor, and in a bat of an island, she comes back with a lemon, and she says, bite it, bite it, Rapam bites the lemon. With a little bit of strength he had left, he sucks out the entire lemon with all of its bitterness. He sucks it out, benishima achas. And it gives him a boost and it revives him. And a little while later, he's speaking to his son and he, he was expressing sort of astonishment at himself that he was able to eat that lemon so ravenously. He actually said he doesn't remember anybody ever eating a fruit with such gusto. And as he's relating the story to his son, the following mem- memories triggered in his mind. 20 years earlier, he's vis- visiting a friend in a nursing home, who Nebuch was deathly ill, and he came with a, a basket of oranges, oranges, and it turns out his friend already had oranges, and he sees next door to the friend is an elder Yid, someone who he recognized, who is actually the Admir of the Bronx, the Rebbe of the Bronx, and he gives this sick man, he gives uh, oranges, and this man was uh, Nebuch, not able to talk, but he bit into those oranges with such gusto and appetite, and his eyes exuded such deep appreciation to Rapam, and Rapam realized that God had paid him back. Mida Kenegan Mida, measure for measure, a lemon for an orange. That just as he provided man with an orange, Hashem didn't say, okay, uh, okay, the next day he's driving this car, here's a lemon, what are you going to do with a lemon? Hashem waited just for the right opportunity, when it wouldn't just be a fruit for a fruit, but it would be a nefesh for a nefesh. And Rav Pam would quote Arachayim HaKadosh, who interprets the Pasuk, V'oisa chesed la'alafim, that HaKadosh Baruch doesn't always pay a person back for his good deeds immediately, Sometimes the Yibam Shalom will save some of the reward for a later generation, for a descendant at a time of need, or for a later point in history, but recognize that at the epicenter of the world, not only do our actions reverberate throughout the world, but they continue to reverberate throughout time. Because while our lives are finite, our actions are infinite. A little bit over a hundred years ago, in Austria, there was a young girl named Schiff. Her last name was Schiff. She had a beautiful voice. She had singing talents that were professional. She was a conversation piece. The thing is, as a religious girl in Austria, what are you going to do? You can't go to the opera. And uh, she had very little options of what she could do with her voice. But news of her voice spread and actually a famous agent heard about it and came and offered her a lucrative deal. She discusses with her parents and her parents said, look, you're a Beis Yaakov girl. You can't exactly go singing with Pavarotti. But the girl didn't want to listen. So the father takes the, do- the daughter to the Rav of Shlomo Baumgarten. The Rav tries to convince the girl to abandon the career she wouldn't hear of it. So the Rav suggested they go to the Kapishnitzner Rebbe, who is in Vienna. So the father takes the girl to the Rebbe. The Rebbe hears the girl's situation. He turns to the girl, he says, Why is it so important for you to go into professional singing? The girl says, Rebbe, I'll be straight with you. It's the fame. This is the, the talent God get, gave me. I need to use it. Everyone will find out. Everybody will know about it. It will uh, elevate me in this world. 
The Rebbe said, I hear. He closes his eyes. He contemplates. And after a few moments, he opens up his eyes. He says, my dear daughter, it is the dream of every Jewish girl to merit to have a son who will illuminate the world in Taira, in mitzvahs. I give you my promise that if you give up this opportunity, you will have a son who will illuminate the world with Taira and Psak Halacha. And the girl breaks down, crying. It's, it's, it's impossible for her. How could she give this up? But with such a bracha, she said, what could I say? Okay. That's the end of the story. That's the end of the story. We don't know anything else. Rav Don Segal, the Mashkiach, he found the story in the Pincus of the Kehilois of Austria. So he figured he has to find out what happened. So he investigated and he found out the girl married somebody and she had a son, Shmuel. So he went to track down Shmuel. Shmuel applied for Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin. He wasn't accepted. Then he was accepted. He then moved to Eretz Yisrael, to Bnei Brak. And he established the Bnei Brak Yeshiva Chachmei Lublin. He wrote the multi voluminous editions, Shal Setshuvas Shevet Halevi, none other than Rav Shmuel Halevi Vazner, the Shevet Halevi. Rav Don Segal went to the Shevet Halevi, he said, Rav Shmuel, is this true story? And Rav Vazner began crying. He said, now I understand. When I was a child, my mother always said, learn well, Shmuel. Be an Erel Chayid, you don't know what I had to give up for you. The choices that we make in this world change the course of history. They reverberate until the end of time. But this is something we know from Chazal. Look no further than Yoina Hanavi. Yoina is sent on a very unusual mission. We don't realize what an unusual mission this is. He's sent to warn the people of Ninveh to do tshuva. Now for a Navi... To warn people to do tshuva, that's par for the course. All the Nevi'im went to tell Klal Yisrael to do tshuva. Yeshaya, Yirmiya, Yechezkel. But what was unusual is y- Yoyna's destination. Yoyna was sent to the city of Ninveh. Ninveh is the capital of Ashur. They were Gentiles. God never before sent a prophet to communicate with Gentiles and never did he again. Never did the Yubam Shem ask Gentiles to do tshuva. Especially in the light of the fact that Goyim are not able to do tshuva. The gift of tshuva was never given to them. Why was Ninveh Zoycha to this divine communication through the Navi Hashem? Why were they given the opportunity to do tshuva? The Chizkuni in Parshas Noyach reveals a secret. There was a man by the name of Ashur. He lived in the times of the Dar HaFlag, the, t- the generation that built the tower. It was the year 1996. He didn't like what they were doing. He didn't agree with it. So, did he remain a silent bystander? He said, no! He said, I can't stay here. If I can't stop them, can't stay there. People are doing something wrong. You can't just mind your own business. I'm out of here. So he left the country. He left Pavel. And he started his own region. He built a city called Ninveh. Says Rivan Sham, you stood up to the pressure of society. You did the right thing. I'm not going to forget about that. I'm going to remember that. The Migdal was built in 1996, 1996, in the year 3085, when the city of Ninveh had sinned up to the heavens. Says Rivan Sham, now is the time that I'm going to remember Ashur's merit. And even though no, if any other city would have sinned like Ninveh, they would have been destroyed like Sedoim, but not Nin- Ninveh. What did they do? There was a man who lived a thousand years before who made a decision, and that decision changed the course of history. I'm going to tell you a little bit of a, a personal story. This Arayin, which is a brand new safe, has a brand new Sefer Torah that just came. Actually, here we are. 
but to start up shul, we didn't have a regular Sefer Torah to read from, for sure not for Zachar, with the Ksav that we wanted, but we didn't have the resources to buy a new Sefer Torah. And one day, before Rosh Hashanah, I got a call. A call was from a friend of mine who was writing Sefer Torah for his kids' bar mitzvah. He doesn't dive in here, it's too far away for him to come on Shabbos. And he said, Rabbi Gnatsin, I want to give your shul a new Sefer Torah. He said, It's very nice of you. There are many shuls. Why our shul? He said, Because in your shul there's no talking. And what could be a greater Kiddush Hashem than that our Sefer Torah goes to a shul that has no talking? He said, That's unbelievable. But this is not an isolated incident. Because this Matanam and Hashemayim is the result of a decision that somebody made a hundred years ago. There was a man by the name of Solomon Glick. And he came to this country in the 30s. He came, he, he ran away from Europe. There were Haskalah was affecting uh, the city. And he came to America, not completely decided of the course of his life. When he would put on the tefillin on the boat, people would say, well, what are you doing with tefillin? You don't wear, people don't wear tefillin in America. You don't need tefillin in America. But he was stubborn. And he said, well, you're telling me I'm not going to wear tefillin? I'm going to wear tefillin. And he came to America. He saw in America, people, uh, people didn't have sukkahs on sukkahs. Now, nowadays, every single house has a sukkah. You know how many sukkahs there were? In New York? There were none. The shul had a sukkah. People didn't have sukkahs. So why don't we have a sukkah? Why can't you build your own sukkah? Why would somebody be ashamed about... So he built the first sukkah. People worked on Shabbos. So he would come into the, the office, he would come into the shop, and they would say, you come in on Saturday or you don't come in on Monday. And every single week he got fired. Until he was able to prove that in five days he could work more than anybody else in six days. And he started to teach himself to read the Shulchan Aruch. And in the Shulchan Aruch it says that if somebody talks by the davening, Gadol avoinoi minasai, the sin is too great to bear. Vigoyerin ban, you have to yell at them. So he says that's what it says in Shulchan Aruch. So some rabbis told him, no, 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 you don't do that in America. But he said to the rabbis, but you, the rabbis don't have a sukkah and they wear leather shoes on Tisha B'av. So they're not observing the halacha. I observe the halacha. This is what the halacha says. So finally, he was one of the founders of Rabbi Hillel David Shul in Flatbush, where this shul is renowned as one of the first shuls in New York where there was no talking by the davening. And that decision that Solomon Glick made 75 to 100 years ago continues to pay dividends today because I am the proud great-grandson of that man. And Min HaShamayim, they're saying, Mr. Glick, the decision you made a hundred years ago is continuing to reverberate because now in your great-grandson shul, they got a brand new Sefer Torah because of you and every time that Sefer Torah is being read from, it's to your merit. Ah, oh, so you ask... What does this have to do with Prince Philip? Do you think it's a coincidence that Prince Philip, who is not part of British monarchy, who is not from the heir to the throne, you think it's a coincidence that he was Zoycha to marry Queen Elizabeth and for all time he will be the father, the patriarch of all future kings of England, starting with the current king of England, Charles? Philip's father, Prince Andrew, he was reduced to an alcoholic gambler. He left his mother. All of Philip's siblings, his three older sisters, became ardent fascists, married high-ranking Nazi officials, and Philip had a future with the Nazis. But Philip believed Nazism was wrong. And like Ashur, he defied Nazism. And he ran away to England, and he fought with distinction in the British Air Force in World War II. And like Ashur, God elevated him to greatness. Because it doesn't matter who you are, a tzaddik, 
a regular person, a man, a woman, a child, a Gentile. The decisions you make in this world make a difference. And the Rebbe remembers them. But it wasn't just Philip. Philip's mother, Alice, who was abandoned by her alcoholic husband, also defied the Nazis. During the Holocaust, Prince Alice invited a Jewish family who she was friends with, the Cohens, to move into her apartment. Her building was right next to the Gestapo's Athens headquarters, and Prince Alice was brought in for interrogation, and she didn't breathe a word. She was hiding Jews. After the war, Alice was named by Yad Vashem, one of the tzaddik Uma Yisrael, one of the righteous of the nations of the world. Her dying wish was to be buried in Israel. She dies in 1969. The royal family ignored her request of, to bury, <laughs> to bury the wife, to bury the wife, the mother of uh, the mother-in-law of the queen in Israel. But in 1988, they got in their head. They need to honor her desire. So they arranged for her remains to be reinterred in Jerusalem. She's buried in the most coveted cemetery in Jerusalem. Har Hazesim. With all the great tzaddikim of the generations. Alice risked her life to save a Jewish family. She's zoicha to be buried in Har Hazesim. She merited her son married the queen. She's now Ima Shalmalchus, her grandson is the current king of England. Her great-grandson, whoever that spoiled kid is, will be the next king of England. Until Mashiach comes, she's Ima Shalmalchus. Because while your life is finite, your decisions are infinite. And the Yibam doesn't forget them. One last story. I heard this story many years ago. I couldn't remember where I heard it from. The details were a bit hazy, and I will not say over a hazy story. Something about Rabbi Matasio Solomon, why he was zoicha to become the mashkiach of the Lakewood Yeshiva, something to do with his mother. I asked around, nobody knew anything about it. I called up Rabbi Matasio's Talmidim. I said, I think Rabbi Matasio said it over at his installation when he was installed as mashkiach. They said, no, we were there. He didn't say it over. There's no such story. I, like, I looked all over, I did my research, there's no record of the story, so I asked, who can I ask to verify the story? I was told, call Rabbi Matasio Solomon's oldest son-in-law. I called the oldest son-in-law, he said, it sounds vaguely familiar. I said, no, vaguely familiar doesn't do it for me. Who can verify the story? He said, call my younger brother-in-law, Halperin. So I called Rabbi Halperin last Friday. So said, Rabbi Halperin, bail me out, I have a Shabbat Shuvah drasha. I told him the hazy details. He said, yes, this is exactly what Ramat said over. He said it over when he was honored by the Lakewood Yeshiva in the Brooklyn Marriott about 15, 20 years ago. I was there, and I'll tell you the truth. Afterwards, I was looking for a recording. There was no recording. I was looking for somebody who wrote it up. Nobody wrote it. It was as if Hashkacha tried to make the story disappear. So Ramat is being honored by the Lakewood Yeshiva, and he got up. And he turned the whole thing on its head. He said, this is not a dinner to honor me. This is a dinner to honor my mother. He says, without a doubt, I want to tell you why Hashem has given me the zuchus to be the mashkiach of Rabbi Aaron Cutler's yeshiva. You see, in 1941, Rabbi Aaron's yeshiva had to relocate to Vilna because of the war. And the Vat Hatzala had a deal in place to rescue Rabbi but they didn't know was it going to be through America or was it going to be through Europe, uh, going to be through England. Meanwhile, this was during the Blitz when England was being bombed nightly by Germany under Goring. They were dropping hundreds of bombs and incendiary devices nightly. And someone from the Vat Hatzala in England needed to be waiting at the phone at the designated date, in case the call would come in, that they would be able to rescue Reb Aaron via England. And then it was finally identified that the designated date would be on a Friday night, and somebody had to wait in a secured bunker, at a secured phone. 
in the black of the darkness of the night of the bombing, if maybe, maybe the call would come in to save Hagoyin Rav Aaron Cutler. And a young lady, a young woman, Etel Solomon, volunteered to wait at the phone for 24 hours over the Shabbos in a secure bunker in case the phone would ring Lagabe Hagoyin Rav Aaron Cutler. And more than 75 years later, Etel Solomon's son, Harav Matasiahu Solomon, declared that the merit of his mother who waited on that Shabbos 24 hours by the phone in case they needed to save Rav Aaron, like Miriam of Ateisatsa, Vachoisei Meirachai Gledea, of the welfare of Moshe Rabbeinu, in the merit of his mother, her son was Zoicha to become the Mashkiach of Rav Aaron Cutler's Yeshiva. So I called up my father, I said, you wouldn't believe this amazing story. He said, Danny, I'm the one who told you the story 15 years ago. I was at the dinner. Because what we do in this world, it makes a difference. The decisions we make, it makes a difference. The choices we make, they reverberate. What we do matters. It matters to the conductor of the universe. But the conductor has empowered us to be conductors in this world. The whole world is waiting for our signal and our choices and our decisions and our actions and our thoughts and our words. They are reverberate forever. They affect our lives. They affect the lives of our children. And they will continue to affect the lives of our descendants forever and ever. A gemar chasimotayva. You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.